Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Aum, the Regional Director for Asia STD Cancer Challenge Foundation. Let me welcome you all to the second discussion of the Driving Oncology of Cancer Care in Asia series. It is so great to see many of our colleagues in cancer care across Asia joining us today. The discussion series has come together thanks to our series co-hosts, the Asian Nation Air Cancer Center Alliance, the Nation Air Cancer Center of Japan, Data Memorial Hospitals and City Cancer Challenge Foundation. We would also like to recognize discussion series partners, Chugai Pharmaceutical and Icon Group for their support as we bring you a discussion each month in July, August, and September. Today, we have a very strong lineup of speakers who will be exploring how CD can lead the development of resource appropriate guidelines for the management of patients with invasive breast cancer in Asia. As we go through the discussion over the next hour and a half, I would like to invite you to ask your question to our panelists via Q&A question. And we will be dedicating time at the end to answer your questions. So before we start the session, we would like to start with the poll question to our attendees. Please click on the appropriate answer that uh, you've been thinking of, and we will be sharing the poll results in a few moments. Thank you so much for answering the poll. Here's the poll result. In the experience, the main barrier to developing resource rate guidelines for the patient with invasive breast cancer in your city is most of the attendees answered that lack of the organization and support. Thank you. So uh, before I, uh, I start the session, I would like to invite the, the moderator, Dr. Chen Ha, the senior consultant breast surgeon from the Subanjaya Medical Center to moderate the sessions. And Dr. Chen Ha has 25 year experience as a pregnancy breast cancer surgeon and has worked and collaborated with the BHGI and other different international organizations for the breast cancer care development. Dr. Chenha, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Aung. I am your moderator for this session. This is the second webinar in the series, Driving Quality Cancer Care in Asia. And this session is on how cities can lead the development of resource appropriate guidelines for the management of patients with invasive breast cancer. So we have four experts today from four different countries and time zones. So the first lecture is on using resource appropriate framework to define resource appropriate breast cancer management guidelines by Ben Anderson, I'll introduce him later. Second one on the critical role of nurses in breast cancer MDTs by Lisa Brown. The third one, the Islamic Development Bank IAEA project on improving quality of cancer care in breast cancer patients by Prof. Or Aisha Tai. And the last one on learning how breast cancer MDT is conducted at the National Cancer Center Japan, including barriers and success factors by Dr. Emi Noguchi. Uh, next, please. Uh, the main goals of this session are to learn from experts and other cities who have successfully developed resource-appropriate breast cancer management guidelines and to share experience and strengthen collaboration across city can cities, partners, and regional experts. Next. Uh, next. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the first speaker. The first speaker we have is Professor Ben Anderson. He's now a medical officer, cancer control, World Health Organization in Geneva. I have known Ben since 2005 when uh, he invited me to be in the Breast Health Global Initiative, which is an international NGO, which Ben established in 2003 to develop clinical practice guidelines for the management of breast cancer in low and middle income countries. Uh, so um, Ben, over to you. Thank you very much. If you can um, release the slides, there we go. And I will start them up. I'd like to thank uh, Shang, Dr. Yip and the team for uh, permitting me to participate today. And what we're gonna be talking about is resource stratification as a process for developing uh, guidelines. This has been applied to breast cancer, but it's really not specific to that. As Dr. Yip suggested, I was, uh, the, I'm the past chair of BHGI that developed this 
uh, concept of resource stratification that's now been taken forward by others, including NCCN, ASCO, and the World Health Organization. WHO has now launched the Global Breast Cancer Initiative, which is to address this, applying some of these principles that we've learned in the past. Let's first talk about the core concepts of resource stratification, because these are often uh, misunderstood. BHGI held a series of global summits, six of them, uh, over uh, a, a nearly 20 year period where these concepts were developed. And that the fundamental idea of resource stratification is to take the known required resources and put them in an order. Now, this is not just a one, two, three, four concept. The definition of each resource level is quite important for making this practical. Basic level resources are those you cannot do without. So breast surgery or breast pathology, we can't cure and treat and cure breast cancer without those resources. So those are ones that must be in place. Limited level or second tier core resources are ones that will make major improvements in survival. Many of the drug therapies fit into this level. Enhanced level are ones that may not necessarily improve survival, comes in other ways, such as breast conservation therapy. It's not that these definitions are the only ones that can be used, but it's a conceptual framework to allow this work. What BHGI did was they broke this out into these four tiers, as you talked as we talked about, but it's comprehensive. You think in terms of health systems, early detection, diagnosis, and treatment by stage, because what this is really about is health systems strengthening. There are different ways of doing this, as we'll talk about in a minute. So in terms of breast cancer management guidelines, this is what WHO in the newly launched Global Breast Cancer Initiative is taking on and applying in these real world settings. The objective of the Global Breast Cancer Initiative is to reduce breast cancer mortality by two and a half percent per year, which has been done in high income countries. And that would save two and a half million lives over a 20 year period. This is really a marriage between the public health sciences approach where we have seen this dropping breast cancer mortality of two to 4% per year, applying the clinical framework that actually made this happen. So that clinical framework, we can think of this in three intervals. The patient interval is how the patient gets into the system, whether it be through screening or presentation of cancer. The second interval is the diagnostic one where we distinguish between what is cancer and what is benign. And the third interval is treatment that whether it be curative therapy or palliative care. While we may be focusing today on that treatment side, we cannot forget about what gets the patient into the system. Because if all of the patients are presenting with advanced stage disease, we cannot anticipate that they will have improvements in outcome. We learned in the African Breast Cancer Disparities and Outcome Perspective uh, study by IARC that there are certain factors that can make major improvements in outcome. You see the bars on the left, you'll see that there's real disparate, there are differences in different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. The different colored bars above the blue shows where the improvements would uh, happen. And while improvement in treatment, that's the red bars will make a difference, downstaging of disease is almost equal. And we cannot forget about social inequalities. If we don't have a way for paying for the care, we cannot anticipate that the patients will make their way through the system. This is really relevant to what we're talking about today. And this sets the stage for the guideline development and utilization, which is the core of what I've been asked to address today. So BHGI working together with CCAN developed this guide for developing resource appropriate breast cancer management guidelines. And I do think there are major misconceptions about what resource stratification guideline development is. It's not a document, it's a process. It's actually the process that is really the essential elements because that process provides this framework for health system strengthening. We need to realize that if we pick unrealistic targets, you know, we don't wanna shoot low, that's understandable, but if we shoot for targets that cannot realistically be achieved, then that's, going to, that's a setup for failure. And we also have to recognize the process is iterative, it's repeated. So we do it once, we implement, we see what happened and we do this again. This is how the Global Breast Cancer Initiative is being set up. So from this framework, resource stratification provides this opportunity for multidisciplinary planning and discussion. 
It creates an evidence-based framework for gap analysis to determine what are the services that we need to have in place next. And it permits a, a method for assessing feasibility and sustainability. Because if we adopt a program that cannot be sustained, that is the definition of failure. You need to have complete team membership in the guideline development process. All of the disciplines need to be in place. So of course we need surgery, radiation oncology and medical oncology. We also have to have imaging, radiology, and we need to have pathology at the table in order to determine what is going to be a re reasonable and realistic approach. But you need equally to have the ancillary and supportive services on board that while physicians may tend, we may tend to think, I can say this as a physician, that we're what's driving this, it's the nurses, it's the physical therapists, it's the navigators, it's all of the things that make it possible to do what we do. And if we don't bring them in in the beginning, we potentially set up a system that's not going to be achievable. We need to know what they're doing behind the scenes as we are interfacing with the patient. And equally, the administrative services need on board because they're the ones that can evaluate feasibility. We need the hospital and clinical administrators, we need the insurers and oversight of the ministries of health and others to see, is this process going to work long-term? So that development process is not something that happens just once. We do begin with initial guideline drafting. So we have to begin with something and rather than starting anew, which is what many countries have done, they just say, oh, well, we need to start from the beginning. Beginning with someone else's framework to say what is going to apply in my setting is a good idea so that you're not reinventing the wheel. You then have internal review to consider the practicality within the system, not a hypothetical system, but the real one. And once we get that feedback, we then go back to the guideline and revise it based upon that internal review. We then present this to external experts because they're the ones that can look at it objectively to say, what's the efficacy? Is this really gonna work? What does our evidence tell us? And then based upon that external review, we then revise again, second round of revision. Then we present this to the administrative, uh, for administrative review to consider the resource requirements and fiscal implications because you can have a hypothetical concept, but if there's no resources that are sustainable, it's not gonna work. And that's when we finalize this guideline. But just when you thought you were done, you have to prepare for re-examination after the implementation. Again, it's it, what this is really about is not a document. What this is really about is a global health system strengthening approach using breast cancer as a model for other diseases. I'd like to consider the example from NCCN. NCCN developed a series of resource stratification frameworks based upon the BHGI methodology. So here you see their algorithm, one page of their algorithm, where at that enhanced level, they're identifying those resources that would be least likely to make a major impact and would come after other resources are in place. They then developed core level resources or limited level resources and basic resources that ultimately can be scaled down into what are those basic resources that have to be in place. The misconception is that what we're doing is certifying substandard care. That's not what's happening here. What we're developing is a pathway for systematic improvement going in ways that are evidence-based and appropriate. NCCN then went on to create harmonized guidelines working with in-country participants. Multiple Sub-Saharan African countries were brought together to look at the existing NCCN frameworks to create what could be considered a standard of care for Sub-Saharan Africa. It may not be realistic in every country, nor is it a fixed rigid structure. It has flexibility. But the goal here is to take what those ideal guidelines use an evidence-based and stratification approach to say, what can we really do here that's going to make a difference? Now NCCN has used this method to create guidelines to cover over 85% of cancers in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a good starting place, not the only one, but it's one to consider. So in summary, resource stratification is a framework for health system strengthening. It is not a method for certifying substandard care. The guideline developing uh, approach is a process. The document is an endpoint that is not the key. It's what we did to get there. The use of this guideline implementation must carefully be considered within a framework of practicality, 
predicted clinical outcomes and sustainability. That's what's gonna make this meaningful. Ultimately, the guideline implementation requires monitoring and assessment to determine the real world successes and failures. It's repeated. That's how we can make improvements and a meaningful health system strengthening. Thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anderson. Um, so from Geneva, we are going to go now to Brisbane, Australia, and I would like to introduce the next speaker. Now, Dr. Anderson has talked about the role of the nurse in guideline development. And uh, the next speaker is Lisa Brown. She's the International Lead of Nursing, Education and Training, Strategic Investment and Clinical Care of the ICON Group in Australia. Lisa is based in Brisbane, Australia. The ICON Group is Australia's largest dedicated cancer care provider and has a simple vision to deliver the best care possible to as many people as possible, as close to home as possible. Lisa has assisted in the drive for patients to receive cancer care closer to home by using a tele-education model for over 10 years to build workforce capacity for all healthcare staff, regardless of their geographical location. Okay, um, Lisa? Hello, everybody. Thank you, um, CCAN, for the opportunity to speak tonight. And thank you, Dr. Cheng Ha, for your introduction. Um, tonight, I would like to introduce you to a patient that I met in my clinical practice, and this is Winnie Yang. And Winnie is a 33-year-old. She's married with two children, a six-year-old boy, Bayo, and a five-month-old baby boy, Zhang Wei. And she works weekends at the family restaurant. Winnie has been diagnosed with invasive lobular carcinoma of her left breast, which is ER positive, PR positive, and HER2 negative. The treatment plan for Winnie is that she's going to be having breast conservation surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and hormone therapy. Now, as we all know, a diagnosis of cancer is a difficult experience, and patients feel a variety of emotions, things such as shock, disbelief, anxiety, fear, anger, and distress. Many patients say that they feel a lack of control, and probably the most scary part for patients is that they say that there's an uncertainty, an uncertainty about their present, and definitely an uncertainty about their future. So when someone is diagnosed with cancer, negotiating in the complex healthcare system can be very overwhelming for the patient and their family. And obviously, access to healthcare services varies depending on where a patient lives. But regardless of the patient's geographical location, cancer patients have a right to best practice evidence-based care, information and support that will help them to navigate their cancer journey, and the opportunity to voice their preferences. So what specifically does a cancer patient need? It is optimal that a breast cancer patient has a central point of contact, access to information about their disease, the different types of procedures that they might have to undergo, their treatment, the possible side effects of their treatment, and how to manage those side effects if they should occur. It's also great if they have the opportunity to communicate their choice in relation to treatment plan and to have coordinated care. With regards to a breast cancer diagnosis, this generally results in the patient meeting a variety of health professionals who manage their care across a number of different settings over a period of time. Now, as we all know, and as you've heard in um, earlier series, is that the multidisciplinary team provides an integrated approach whereby all the participants consider the treatment options for the patient and decide on what is the best for the patient. A multidisciplinary team can obviously be represented by a number of different disciplines, and this may not be realistic in all of our clinical contexts. But with regards to the nurse, the nurse plays a central role within the multidisciplinary team. Despite the patient meeting many people, there is no one that they will see more than a nurse during their cancer journey. This is just a photo of one of our medical oncologists in Singapore. 
because in addition to Australian sites, uh, we all, ICON also has sites in Singapore, Hong Kong and China. So this is one of our medical oncologists with our nurses. Um, we feel very strongly about the multidisciplinary team and they all work extremely well together. So what is the nurse's role in caring for someone with cancer? We provide comfort and support where the link between the cancer patient and the rest of the multidisciplinary team. We possess empathy. We have advanced communication skills. We work with uh, patients of different ages and we also work in a variety of settings. So going back to Winnie that I discussed earlier, Winnie attends the clinic to visit her medical oncologist prior to her first dose of chemotherapy. So Winnie has had her surgery and now she's six weeks post her surgery and she's going to start her chemotherapy. And nurse Annie meets with Winnie and her mother to collect her medical um, history and identify if Winnie has any questions or concerns. So Winnie's main concerns at this time is that she has to stop breastfeeding her little boy. She has limited movement in her left arm, so it's therefore difficult to attend to her children. She has pain in the breast and surrounding tissue, and she has side effects of chemotherapy. Winnie knows her doctor extremely well, and she knows that she can ask the doctor all of these questions, but she feels that the doctor's very, very busy, and so she doesn't really know how to talk to the doctor. She's also worried about asking for pain relief because she doesn't want to feel drowsy. She wants to make sure that she can look after the family and particularly her baby. So when we think about Winnie, we've got to try and identify what is the role of the nurse with her concerns. So from the point of view of the multidisciplinary team, the nurse assists the patient with a seamless cancer journey. And we do this through effective and timely communication between all health professionals. And this includes the local healthcare team. We support the patient as they meet new health professionals. We coordinate multiple appointments and we seek out patient information that is culturally and linguistically appropriate. We need to listen to the patient's questions and concerns, and we should ensure that culturally appropriate care is provided. We help the patient understand their disease and make treatment decisions. We explain their cancer treatment and their care options, their treatment side effects, and what the impact of the cancer and the treatments may be on their daily life. We assist with symptom management and we connect the patient with the right people and the right resources at the right time. But with regards to what is the most critical role of the nurse for the patient and in the MDT is we are the patient's voice. So being a patient advocate is the most important thing we need to make sure that the patient's voice is heard in any discussions related to their treatment plan. So reflecting on our role in the MDT and Winnie's concerns, I just want to step through what, what we would do as a nurse in collaboration with the healthcare professionals, particularly the treating doctor. So Winnie has said she's very concerned about having to stop breastfeeding. And obviously she does need to do this because she's going to be having chemotherapy. So in collaboration with the treating doctor, we would arrange for Winnie to see a midwife or a paediatric nurse specialist that is age appropriate to assist with information and resources. Because obviously me as the nurse or as the cancer nurse, we have to bring in other members of the MDT to help with the breastfeeding because that's not my specialty. Winnie has said she has limited movement in her left arm, so we inform Winnie's treating medical officer, we refer to a relevant specialist if available, and if not, we access their specific resources and help. We ask the doctor about pain, making sure that it will not cause drowsiness. We discuss non-pharmacological ways to ease her discomfort. And we talk about the side effects of chemotherapy, make sure she has written and verbal information, and ensure she has 24 hour uh, contact information. So what is the role of the nurse in the MDT? 
We serve as one of the patient's greatest advocates. We will ensure that the patients and their families' issues are heard. Nurses are there for the breast cancer patient to listen to them, to treat them, to educate them, and to support them. And I just want to close with this quote from Pope Francis. The role of nurses in assisting the patient is truly irreplaceable. Like no other, the nurse has a direct and continuous relationship with patients, takes care of them every day, and listens to their needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. I would love to have a nurse like you to take care of my patients. Yes. Good night. All right. From Australia, we're going back to Malaysia now. This is where I'm from, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, can I have the next one? Ah, yes. Now, the next speaker is Professor Noor Aisha Tai. She is a close friend of mine from Malaysia, and we've worked together for many years in breast cancer. So Aisha is a breast surgeon and is a professor in the University of Malaya. Her interests are strongly correlated to patient care and outcomes, patient education and in quality improvement projects. She is also one of the leaders in the CityCan project in Greater Petaling in Malaysia. She will speak on the Islamic Development Bank IAEA project on improving the quality of cancer care in breast cancer patients. Um, Aisha. Right, so, um, so I'm tasked to speak about the Islamic Development Bank and International Atomic Energy Agency project on improving quality of cancer care in breast cancer patients. So um, Greater Petaling is a, a, a city in Malaysia and we are the ninth city to join the City Cancer Challenge. Um, and the main objective of the City Cancer Challenge is a world with quality and equitable cancer care for all. So to improve the quality of cancer care in all its cancer care institution, public and private, CCAN proposes capacity building activities that will introduce and disseminate a multidisciplinary and evidence-based clinical decision-making approach for breast cancer treatments in the city. So really, the development of multidisciplinary teams, resource-appropriate guidelines and treatment protocols are expected to ensure the quality and standard of cancer care across the city uh, and provide the information for procurement of oncology medicines, devices, equipment and technical needs. This will lead to increased access to quality care for women with breast cancer. So the Islamic Development Bank and the International Atomic Energy Agency have partnered to launch an urgent call for innovation to find and reward solutions for strengthening national health systems in the area of breast and cervical cancer prevention. So the SICAN Foundation in February 2020 put in a application for Greater Petaling City to be able to use the funds to provide a capacity building within Greater Petaling City. Um, and what uh, and they were awarded the Sikan uh, Foundation was awarded the grant, which is a twelve month project implementation that will start in November this year to November next year, and the grant amount is USD fifty thousand. And uh, to just mention, uh, we have this uh, city executive committee that is made up of the multi sectoral uh, stakeholders within the city to guide the um, development of Sikan in the city. Uh, so the project coordinator has been appointed to lead the project and the SICAN technical cooperation team will provide and support on the project plan development and implementation. So um, uh, I'm glad to see this grant is also available annually. So this year again, there was another call, but it has closed on the 15th of August. Again, uh, people can put in applications for this grant to assist in strengthening their national health system in the area of breast and cervical cancer prevention. So what is Greater Petaling Sikan? It really is an area um, surrounding the district of Petaling in the state of Selangor in Malaysia. Uh, we are going to uh, actually cover about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 municipality areas within uh, the area around Greater Petaling City. So within this area, we have about 88 hospitals giving cancer treatment hospitals, which uh, are really among people with gynecological, surgical, as well as oncological departments. 
And within this 88, we have 21 hospitals providing oncology services, 15 with radiotherapy services. And also within this 88, we have four academic centers with university hospitals. So the key output of this grant is to develop one norm and regulation for the creation and operation of a multidisciplinary cancer team for breast cancer. Breast cancer guidelines will be adapted from national and or international guidelines through an internal consensus process with relevant cancer care professionals in Greater Tallinn. And these clinical guidelines for breast cancer will be reviewed by a panel of international experts. Breast cancer professionals in different uh, un, uh, disciplines, pathology, imaging, surgery, medical oncology, radiation oncology, as well as nursing and supporting palliative care providers, will be com uh, able to complete a short-term clinical fellowship up to about two weeks in the Cancer Reference Centre, and for which uh, India, the Tata Trust Memorial Hospital, has been appointed. And by adapting and setting appropriate breast cancer guidelines that is finalised and endorsed by local authorities, we will be able to uh, send out finalised approved guidance and protocols for breast cancer, diagnosis and treatments, and other areas, disseminated through a workshop. Six uh, echo tele mentoring sessions will be conducted to facilitate the rollout of this approved guidance and protocols and to resolve challenges encountered in specific areas. So the beneficiaries of this project are women with breast cancer. And uh, we expect that other cities in Malaysia will learn from the experience of Greater Petaling and start implementing multidisciplinary approaches as well. For health professionals, the university, public and private hospital doctors diagnosing and treating cancer will directly benefit from this project and we envision primary care doctors will also benefit from this project. So in the long term, we expect the development of multidisciplinary team, resource appropriate guidelines and treatment protocols to make significant contribution towards the reducing the risk of women dying prematurely of breast cancer. So I would be, I'm quite happy to report, uh, we have started a very initial engagements where we recognize that we need to get a multidisciplinary team of people to co-create um, this project together. And uh, so far we have gathered about 16 breast surgeons, two breast radiologists during the meeting, and we are forming the committee, uh, which we have already got eight volunteers. Um, so what we envision this to be is to also focus on the scope of what we're covering. Are we just covering diagnosis, treatment, palliative care? Are we covering screening or survivorship care as well? Um, and of course, we have uh, multiple local resources. So for your information, Malaysia actually have a uh, Malaysian clinical practice guidelines in the third edition. However, we have been a bit slow in the um, renewal of this edition. So for example, the second edition was uh, published in 2008 but the third one only came out in 2020. The reason is our health technology assessment unit in the Ministry of Health is severely understaffed and we are managing all types of diseases, not just cancer. So there are multiple resources available from academia, from the uh, Academy of Medicine, College of Surgeons, Pathology, Radiology, Malaysia Oncology Society, and there are already existing CPD programs. Um, and all we need to do is to organize ourselves to be able to uh, contribute to a single goal. So the external resources that we are very happy with is the CCAN Global Partners, where the ESCO and then the Breast Care Nursing um, so, uh, Society, as well as Breast Surgery International, will help us in uh, forming this type of um, guidelines as well as treatment protocols. So I'm glad that uh, Ben Anderson mentioned about the resource stratified NCCN guidelines. I think wonderfully NCCN guidelines are, adapt, uh, are, are like renewed twice a year, I think, and uh, the, it is resource stratified. And we do know within the city of Petaling, many hospitals have different levels of care. We, some hospitals have maximal, some people have limited. Um, but in a way, as you said, you need a, a basic um, level that is of quality. So this is something that we hope to do through the tele-echo sessions um, that we are accorded with by adapting or harmonizing the guidelines to, to figure out what would be the best for the city and looking at protocols and also thinking about how we're going to evaluate and monitor this project. And as what uh, you mentioned, uh, Prof Anderson, is that sustainability would be the main challenge to see the success or failure of the project. Um, I think what we have suggested is to bring together multiple subspecialists who actually work around 
uh, Greater Petaling and we break it into two different zones, Northwestern Greater Petaling and Southeastern Greater Petaling, where we have at least uh, three uh, core hospitals that could take turns to provide this sharing session between uh, generalists. So we have almost a lot of general surgeons treating cancer out there. Um, so we need subspecialists to provide some guidance and uh, it's a two-way sort of sharing where we also learn from them. And the spokes or the people that will benefit, even the hub will benefit, would be a hospital from Ministry of Health, clinics, as well as uh, private hospitals, as well as general practitioners. So available funding for capacity building, mobility, administrative support will help us to sort of uh, give the seed fund to provide some sort of sustainable solution for the city. The implementation to support and disseminate breast cancer clinical guidelines and treatment protocols is something that we have not done very successfully in the past. We this is the third edition of our guideline, but I'm sure there are many people out there practicing without re realizing there is a guideline. Okay, leveraging on existing resources, robust subspecialty groups, networks uh, with generalists and primary care providers, I think we should be able to at least, we can't force people to follow guidelines, but at least we can educate everybody to improve their knowledge as well as sharing of this knowledge would improve the referral networks among primary, secondary and tertiary care. So again, we need to put in a sustainability program within this uh, project to improve quality of care. So this is actually my last slide. So with that, um, I'll stop here. Profi, thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha. That was a very uh, interesting talk about our uh, CCAN. Uh, now, the last speaker is going to be Dr. Emmy Noguchi. She's the Head of Physicians Department of Medical Oncology, National Cancer Center Hospital, Japan, who is going to tell us about how breast cancer MDT is conducted at the National Cancer Center and including the barriers and success factors. Please note that NCC Japan is one of the core hosts in this uh, webinar series. Dr. Noguchi is a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer and gynecological cancer research and treatment. She is an active member of ESCO, the Japan Japan Society of Clinical Oncology, the Japanese Breast Cancer Society, as well as the Japanese Society of Medical Oncology, where she serves on the Scientific Program Committee and the Board Certification Committee. Um, Dr. Emi Noguchi. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jen He. Uh, I am honored to participate in this session today. So. I will share my screen. Okay. I will give a, a small talk about MDT in National Cancer Center, Japan. National Cancer Center Hospital, located in the central of Tokyo, uh, about two kilometers from Olympic Village, And we have about 600 beds, 400 doctors, uh, 600 nurses, and 70, 70 pharmacists. The outpatient clinic receives about 1,400 patients per day. We do outpatient chemo for about uh, 200 per day. The annual number of surgeries about 5,500, and 700 breast cancer surgeries are performed per year. Here is a brief look at medical expenditure in Japan using indications as in previously published by Sikian. Now, every citizen have the universal health insurance coverage in Japan. And also breast cancer is the most common cancer in women in also in Japan. In contrast to Western countries like Australia, uh, the, it shows a common pattern in Asia with a peak incidence uh, before menopause age. 
So the, it is most common in the 40s and 60s. And with advances in diagnosis and diagnostic and therapeutic modalities, the treatment of breast cancer has become more and more complex and MDT involvement is essential. Uh, uh, in creating our center, uh, cancer centers in Japan uh, designated by the government are required to conduct MDT uh, um, called cancer board for our treatment. We have M several MDT meetings once a week among surgeon, medical oncologist, radiologist, radiation oncologist, pathologist, and pharmacist to practice evidence-based treatment of breast cancer. Every single patient is discussed at the MDT meeting at some point, uh, whether uh, it is to decide on a preoperative or the postoperative treatment plan, or in case of recurrence. And institutional guidelines, uh, we issued institutional guidelines adapted from national or international guidelines. And uh, since many breast cancer patients in Japan develop the disease at a relatively young age, as I mentioned, um, MDTs for fertility preservation program and hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome are important. Now, as unique uh, in our hospital, um, these MDTs are read by, uh, especially read by nurses, uh, because the nurses who are often consulted by patient at first, and uh, also psychologists and medical social workers are also working together. And uh, we have MDT for supportive care. Uh, it is also read by nurses and pharmacists. MDTs uh, can be implemented in a number of professions, including cancer treatment specialists, uh, such as surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, uh, also palliative, palliative care specialists, psychiatrist, and medical staffs, such as nurses, pharmacists, nutritionists, and therapists. Uh, we have a uh, dedicated uncle psychiatrist who uh, are managed for people who faced with various problem, uh, emotional or psychiatric problem uh, during their cancer journey. And um, MDTs marked with a red star uh, are reimbursed by public health insurance or leading to the promotion of MDT in each institution. Possible barriers is still uh, limited time and resources. The uh, challenge is to create a system that does not rely solely on the individual effect, effect, effort. Uh, our hospital is one of the leading cancer centers, so we may still be blessed with resources. There are still not enough medical oncologists entire in Japan, and in many facilities, uh, surgeons do chemo. Oh, especially in the rural area. Also, uh, tracking after MDT, including compliance to eventual treatment that we have not done yet, would lead to improvement 
in quality in the quality of cancer care. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, to my all the four speakers for your excellent presentation. We have voices from the field now. Yes. Before we summarize, uh, can we have the voices from the field? The first person is Dr. Nirma Lamich Chain, who is consultant, Department of Surgical Oncology, and Chief of the Urological Oncology Services, Chairman of the Board of Directors, National Cancer Hospital, Bharatpur, Nepal. Dr. Lamich Chain, are you here? Good afternoon, uh, CKN Group, for inviting me. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, we can hear you. I am Dr. Lami Chane from uh, one of the leading cancer hospitals in Nepal. And uh, is, this talk is very relevant to us in the sense that uh, we are also very primitive in using guidelines for the sake of, I mean, everybody is doing some work, but everybody works quite independently and it's very difficult to bring people together uh, to discuss the issue and uh, discuss further patient. So uh, from Dr. Anderson's talk, uh, what I realized is this is essentially a group work that is, should, be, should evolve in process so that uh, we can probably draft a guide and then bring people together, ask for the external review and then make things come together for the benefit of patient. I mean, uh, in overall, I found this talk very useful and uh, I, I am very inspired that uh, we should be able to do uh, with your uh, help to, to, to start from at least from one of the cancer, let's say easiest cancer, probably breast cancer, and then implement into the other, I mean, diseases in due course of time. Thank you for the, uh, I mean, time and the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Lamachani. The next uh, voice from the field is from Dr. Wahua Minzu, who is a consultant radiation oncologist, radiotherapy department, Yangon General Hospital, Myanmar. So uh, good, good afternoon again. And I'm Dr. Wahua Minzu, and I'm consultant radiation oncologist, and also a palliative care clinician in Yangon General Hospital. Thank you, Sikhen opportunity to share our Yangon experience in developing resource-appropriate guidelines on clinical management of breast cancer. Our Yangon City joined the City Cancer Challenge Initiative since 2017. Uh, with the leadership of the Yangon City Executive Committee and the technical assistant from CCAN, uh, the multidisciplinary and multi-institutional project team was set up. I was part of it. I contributed in the comprehensive need assessment process of SIGEN in Yangon in 2018. The important challenges we found is inadequate accessibility to early and timely treatment due to lack of multidisciplinary treatment, including palliative care and resource stratified guidelines. guidelines. And we analyzed the resource available review the international guidelines and benchmarks and work together in a team to develop the draft zero guideline. As the next step, the clinical and non-clinical specialists from both public and private hospitals in Yango and representative of the scientific and patient society were invited to city consultation workshops to review the draft zero guideline and to validate the resource adapted to the context of Yango. Based on the recommendations in the city consultation workshop, we work together to upgrade the great uh, draft zero to draft one guideline. Then the draft one guideline was consulted with the multidisciplinary group of international experts supported by the CCAN and the ESCO in international consultation workshop. The aim of the international consultation was two lines and benchmarks. After the international consultation, we worked together again with the international expert to finalize the guideline. At the final stage, the final guideline was approved 
by the Yango City Executive Committee and endorsed by the, our Ministry of Health in December 2020. Uh, because of the current political situations in our country, the dissemination of guidelines is on hold. In my perspective, the key assess is that knowing of the current situation of OMS healthcare system, comprehensive need assessment, the teamwork of experts from different specialties in oncology care. The most important thing is we had to understand the important roles of each specialty along the cancer survivorship depend upon the disease trajectories and to tailor the treatment option in accordance with the technical capacity and availability of the resource in our Yango. We all know that breast cancer is able to give the multidimensional suffering. And our aim is to promote their quality of life of patients, families and caregivers and for the quality care. So our Young Home Breast Cancer Guideline highlighted the importance of participation of the different disciplines and the integration of palliative and supportive care in oncology care and nursing care in the treatment options in all stages of breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wawa Minzu. All right, so we have finished our presentations by our four experts and the two voices from the field. So it is clear that adherence to clinical practice guidelines and uh, multidisciplinary management improves survival. And uh, however, guidelines have to be resource appropriate. And we've also heard in this uh, session, uh, the barriers and to actually implementing guidelines, as well as the barriers to even a multidisciplinary treatment in a national center uh, cancer, uh, like Japan, which is uh, very uh, large and well known because of limited time resources and also tracking post-MDT decisions and also tracking compliance to the uh, guidelines are very important. So now we will go to the questions and um, thank you, Rolando. He's filtered the questions and I will read them. Um, this one sounds like it's for Ben Anderson. What is the role of health technology assessment and cost-effectiveness studies to develop resource-appropriate guidelines? Well, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wawa Minzu. All right, so we have finished our presentations by our four experts and the two voices from the field. So it is clear that adherence to clinical practice guidelines and uh, multidisciplinary management improves survival. And uh, however, guidelines have to be resource appropriate. And we've also heard in this uh, session, uh, the barriers and to actually implementing guidelines, as well as the barriers to even a multidisciplinary treatment in a national center uh, cancer, uh, like Japan, which is uh, very uh, large and well known because of limited time resources and also tracking post-MDT decisions and also tracking compliance to the uh, guidelines are very important. So now we will go to the questions and um, thank you, Rolando. He's filtered the questions and I will read them. Um, this one sounds like it's for Ben Anderson. What is the role of health technology assessment and cost-effectiveness studies to develop resource-appropriate guidelines? Well, thank you very much for that question because it's really very important. Uh, in assessing an implementation strategy, you need to know what your technology is going to cost and the workforce costs that are, are gonna be there because the ministry that's gonna pay for this has to allocate adequate resources for that. A challenge of this is that if you look at diseases one at a time, if we look at breast cancer and then later we look at cervical cancer and after that we look at a different cancer, it makes everything look very expensive rather than thinking of it as a whole system because it's actually the same infrastructure regardless of disease. So uh, the WHO cancer team led by Andrea Abawe uh, has been uh, developing um, assessment tools and costing tools working together with uh, IAEA, the PACT uh, group, and they are soon going to be launching a model that, that has already been uh, implemented uh, in, in certain settings, that what it does is it gives an assessment of what are your actual needs and what, are the, what does that translate to in costs? 
because one of the biggest problems has been the ministries have been markedly underfunding cancer, 5%, 10% of what they really need. So we need to know the technology, but don't forget about the people that run the machines. If you buy the machines, like a bunch of mammography machines and don't have radiologists, that really won't help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Another question also for Ben. Um, can you talk a little on the challenges of implementation in settings where this has been attempted? I did see this question from Sanchi Aranda, who is uh, past president of uh, UACC. Thank you uh, for the question. Uh, it's multifactorial where the limitations are. Um, one of them is the development of, of really unrealistic expectations, as we talked about. So I, we've seen examples of countries that talk about mammographic screening in settings where women are presenting with cancers that you can see from across the room. And while mammographic screening is a good concept, it's very expensive and you need to have the infrastructure that makes it relevant. So doing resource stratification is, is part of that, that issue. I, we've seen many examples where you ask, do you use guidelines? And the clinician would say, oh yes, I use guidelines. I use ASCO, I use NCCN, I use ESMO. But when you actually look at what is happening to the patients, it's a small fact, fraction of the patients that care because of the obstacles, the underfunding, the other limitations. So that's why the, it, it really, I think we need to see more studies and analyses of this. We're starting to see publications about the resource stratified frameworks that NCCN has been doing. And I think we're gonna see more. One of the biggest issues here is not measuring outcome. The, the ministries need to, it is a small investment, relatively speaking, to, to, to as implement res, um, the measurement strategies to figure out what worked and what did not. So that I, I think we're see, beginning to see these being implemented in real world strategies. And I'm very excited about what's gonna be happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, because I think that's where it's gonna be going forward. But I, I, I would say to Sancha's question, it's to realize that the guideline development is not an endpoint; it's a very beginning point in this health system strengthening aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. The next question is again for you from Dr. Hadi Mohammad Abu Rashid. Uh, have you thought about the answers of the dilemma? What is in it for me, for the local healthcare providers to adopt and follow the developed local guidelines? I, I have thought a lot about that. And I do think that it goes outside of the guideline development to a degree. But what we have a tendency to do is have unrealistic expectations whether it be of the clinicians or of the ministries that, you know, we say, well, you're supposed to give everything to everybody and they don't have the resources. The same thing is true of clinicians. You, you have to have a survivable model. So it, this is not about altruism, it's about practical solutions. And, and in many settings, we, we see it in situations where there's a public system that does cancer care in the morning, but it, the, the clinicians are not paid nearly enough in order to actually be able to do that work full time. So instead, in the afternoon or evenings, they go to their private practices where they actually are able to make a livable salary. So I think that when we talk about implementation, you have to make sure that you're really developing things that people can do and not on a volunteer basis, because volunteer bases, by definition, will end. They will not be sustainable. So that it, every system is going to be a little different, but you have to have clarity of thinking about how to do that. Thank you again. Thank you very much. This is a question for Lisa. How can we increase the recognition of the nurses as professional members of the MDT? Uh, Lisa? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think um, obviously we're getting more and more of a voice in most of our clinical contexts. But I believe the only way that we can raise our voice is for nurses to actually share what we can do. So um, by making sure that we promote ourselves wherever we work and identify what it is that we can bring to the multidisciplinary team. So similar to what I shared about Winnie tonight, 
we've all got stories um, and I think sometimes stories do work in saying what is our role within an MDT of how we can uh, work with the doctors and work with all of the other members. So I think the task is really on us to raise our profile and to say what we can offer um, in that sort of environment. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, in the low and middle income countries, I'm sure most of the doctors here from there will realize that the role of nurses is actually very much below that of doctors here. And we always have problems like we have got breast care nurses who will speak to the patients, but the patients will always go back and ask the surgeon because they just don't trust the nurses. Aisha, what do you think? Do you have that problem? Mm. Yeah. Uh Yes, I think the general um, you know, consensus of patients may be like that, but once they get into the therapy and they realise that these nurses are there for them, then they start responding because it's very usual in clinic, like even like two, three years later, they still remember their nurse that helped them through their the journey. So I, th I think we should empower the nurses. And I think by having this collaboration with nurses themselves, because in the past, it's been the doctors training the nurses. And hence, sometimes um, I think nurses don't get empowered to see that they can play such amazing roles. So I'm so thankful that Lisa is on board. And uh, hopefully by training our local nurses, empowering them to become nurse leaders as well, um, we can get more support for quality cancer care. Well, there's one question for Aisha that I sort of missed. Why aren't there clinical oncologists in your hub? Oh, actually, the oncologists would definitely be uh, into this program. Um, there are very few clinical oncologists. Uh, I have to say the central part of Malaysia, which Greater Petaling uh, uh, resides, is the greatest concentration of uh, medical and radiation oncologists in Malaysia. So a lot of people question, why are you doing it in a very high resource setting? So the issue is uh, in Malaysia, I think it's more of the equitable access to care. So I think uh, we have not been able to um, uh, solve this issue. And uh, oncologists, I think they are the very few of them. Um, they provide, they have a lot of CMEs. They, our Malaysian oncologists actually Held, hold regular CPD, CMEs at international levels, bringing in ESCO, many, many things. Um, but I think what we have forgotten are the generalists that actually manage the patients. So for example, I think in Malaysia, the issue is late presentation. So in the uh, central region, especially in the public hospitals and uh, among the poor, uh, we see a lot of people presenting with stage three and four. Um, we even shown in our hospital, the profit, you were still there, that the public patients were, the survival rates are lower than the private sector patients in the same institution. And that was explained by the high stage at presentation. So I think for medical oncologists, definitely they are part of the team. And maybe it's a bit strange that uh, none of the oncologists turned up for our first engagement because they were having another webinar uh, parallel to that meeting. Um, but for, you know, definitely Malaysia Oncology Society is within the CCAN framework itself. Um, and uh, we have many uh, of them uh, participating in all the groups. So I think the CCAN is a wonderful framework to implement and to get people from different sectors together. So definitely oncology is involved. We're not excluding anyone. Yeah, I mean... And being from Malaysia and from uh, Greater Petaling, I have to tell, say that the Seekan in Petaling Jaya is a rather artificial environment where it is a very high resource setting. But you cannot actually do the Seekan challenge in, let's say, East Malaysia, where you do not have all the multidisciplinary uh, team. So I'm not sure in the rest of uh, the Seekan cities, without a multidisciplinary team, you actually cannot implement the Seekan uh, yeah program, right? The second project. The, the beauty of the uh, technology and because of COVID, a lot of our platforms have moved to virtual platforms. And hence, I think the word from the Tele Echo, I think Professor Sanjay, uh, he was saying that uh, you want to democratize knowledge. And I think by providing good resource where people are um, uh, higher resource, that means there are more people, more oncologists, more specialist surgeons, you can accord a very nice environment where people share high-level information and, and care.
to other people in the country. So I think by running workshops and as well as uh, MBTs online, you can get people from, even from Sarawak to participate. Um, and, and one thing I like about the CCAN is that it's something like a transitional leadership framework where people who are within the committees, uh, actually a lot of them are from Ministry of Health themselves and they hold leadership roles in Ministry of Health. Hopefully by learning uh, from, I think the biggest challenge is the implementation side. Uh, we have had many documents in Malaysia. We have cancer control policies written up uh, like every what four years or something like that. But the implementation has always been very difficult. So I think this is um, a nice platform for all of us to sort of think about how uh, we can start small and um, uh, make it larger by um, you know uh, being able to show some successful pilots and sustainable pilots and then replicating them in other parts of the country. Thank you very much. I said there's a question for Amy. There are no regulatory actions in Japan to ensure that professionals prescribing oncology medicines have to have special training for that like to prescribe radio therapy. Amy, um, no. can you answer this question? What are the, the regulatory actions in Japan? Yes, uh, historically, uh, surgeon do chemo or cancer uh, treatment uh, who did not have uh, certificated, but oh, oh, the, uh, the change is uh, going since 10 years ago, uh, the certificated medical oncologist, uh, uh, the number of certificated medical oncologists rise to about 10,000 for these 10 years. And uh, some uh, pharmaceutical drugs are, are required to be prescribed by the certificated uh, medical oncologist. The government set the requirement. Yes, I think in most countries that are actually now um, credentialing, you know, we call it credentialing and privileging, where certain doctors will be credentialed to prescribe uh, oncology medicines. And uh, you have to actually be credentialed for everything nowadays. All right, let's go on to the next question. This sounds like for Ben, how can we prioritize patients when recommendations and clinical practice guidelines are not able to be funded by the limited resources? I think that is a very important question. And uh, we actually have a uh, manuscript now in press at the Lancet Oncology. And it was an analysis of healthcare systems looking at what are the common features associated with that dropping uh, breast cancer survival. And uh, the two factors that, that in this global systems uh, work that we found that were associated with improved survival were, one was degree of universal health coverage, which is relevant to the question. And the other is number of public cancer centers per 10,000 cancer patients. So one is about funding and the other is about access. And it's really interesting to see the science is completely backing us up. We seem to learn, have to learn over and over again that when there's no funding for the cancer, you cannot expect the system to make improvements in outcome because the patients can't actually participate. And so we have to get out of that ivory tower approach and realize realistic funding strategies are critical. And if the family becomes financially devastated, um, by virtue of, of what that's going it, it's not going to happen. And I, I, I think of Lisa Brown's presentation, if the women are picking between their own cancer care and putting shoes on their kids' feet, they'll pick the sh kids' shoes every time. And, and we really have to get out of that strategy and think that it's going to money from heaven falling uh, like gold coins. So that I think the answer is going to be different in different environments, but until we recognize underfunding means it won't happen, it won't happen. Thank you. Yes, definitely, because we have done studies on financial toxicity, financial catastrophe in cancer care, and breast cancer seems to be quite an expensive treatment, you know, because you can have chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy, because you need so many treatments, and all now all the targeted therapy. So breast cancer is getting to be a very expensive cancer to treat. Uh, um, Shanghar, can, can I add to what you're saying? Because as I've been working more 
with ministries and other groups you, to convince a ministry that you need to, uh, that they should be paying for this, they look in very uh, somewhat abstract ways about the cost of, we, we had a question about cost effectiveness and, and uh, where to do that. They look at these return on investment cases. How much do you need to invest and what am I gonna get out of it? And that's a very reasonable way to think about things, but we need to make sure that our evidence is put together with appropriate timelines. Work that we do today is something that may take five to 10 years to see the benefit. So I think one of the things we wanna do, we need to bring our economists on board to help us to make the case for how this really is financially, you're right. Some of the things we do are very expensive and other things we do are very affordable. Let's not forget about the affordable parts as we struggle about the question of targeted therapies, as an example. Yes. Thank you. Sorry because, for uh, our, our studies here in Malaysia have shown that even with universal health care, we do have universal health care in Malaysia. Uh, cancer patients, 45% uh, of patients with cancer went to financial catastrophe because there's a lot of costs that are actually not covered by universal health care. Universal health care is great for primary care. Don't you think so? Your children get vaccinated. You know, you, you don't have infectious diseases. You don't have all these uh, infectious diseases anymore. But that's when the NCDs come into play, you see. So treating NCDs become very important once you get your infections and your diarrhea under control. When I was a medical student, we used to have a diarrhea ward. Now we don't have such things anymore. So um, again, this is something to think about financial toxicity. And we did the study, the financial toxicity study to convince the government they were not paying enough. And when we presented it, they did not believe the data. Evidence, you know, they don't believe the data. So it's a bit difficult to convince the government, you know, that they need more money. Okay, let me see. Are there any more questions? And a uh, question for Ben and Siken. Can we have access to the BHGI Siken guide that was shown in your presentation? I think, Ben, uh, they've asked you whether they could have your slides. So I've, uh, I've sent a PDF of the slide set to our uh, organizers, and uh, Rolando Camacho uh, can make the um, guide available can but yes all of these things are are available thank you okay and that's a remark not a question from a gynecologist in myanmar is that one of my old students is it you say see kind yeah you were with me in ummc in 1999 to 2000 goodness and you say that as a gynecologist you always take the opportunity to treat to teach breast examination and public awareness of breast cancer that's great i think ben this is another Thing that you would say is in it women's cancers all come together so women who go for a pap smear or for gynecological examination or for delivery they should also be taught uh, breast health so this is, this, uh, this is something we're working on uh, in the global breast cancer initiative and uh, we're developing a curriculum. It's not new it, because you know anybody who's trained in surgery these are familiar concepts but it's the how do you work up a breast lump? How do we, what are the criteria that, that we identify of when to put a needle in the breast? And when is it we don't need to do more? The comment about breast pain, if you, if you uh, just open the doors and say, do you have any breast symptoms without an educational program, you'll get very young women who have physiologic breast pain coming in. And it takes a lot of resources to do diagnostic workups. So I think that thinking through the educational curricula and how you get it out there so that uh, that diagnostic component, making a, re a good diagnosis in a reasonable period of time, this is an essential aspect. So while the CCAN guidelines have been focused on the treatment side, you cannot forget about the diagnostic workup part for the reasons that we were talking about earlier on. I'm very hopeful that in the next few years, GBCI will be coming up with, with good methodology that can be applied globally. Thank you. Yes, we are all looking forward to that. And now um, we have 10 more minutes. Can we have anything from our uh, voices from uh, Dr. Lamachane and Dr. Wawa Minzu? Um, you all mentioned that you have great problems in implementing guidelines or even implementing multidisciplinary care in the low resource settings in uh, Nepal and in uh, Yangon. 
Any of the panelists have anything to offer? To advise Dr. Lamachani and uh, uh, Dr. Lamachani, would you like to say something? Yes, I mean, uh, cancer is not being given much priority at the moment because as you mentioned, I mean, you have got rid of diarrhea already, but we are still struggling with the diarrhea in the country at the moment. So, I mean, it's being focused, but not much. So the issue here is, uh, I mean, the treatment disparities, as you mentioned, I mean, many doctors are involved, uh, surgeons mainly are involved in the treatment of breast cancer, and there are very few MDTs to discuss with, and there are very few centers who has got radiotherapy services. So uh, most of the time, the patient has to travel to the different hospital for completion of treatment. This is one issue. And another issue is, I mean, making doctors understand that, I mean, you, you make a decision in free hand that will benefit the patient in long term. This is very difficult to make them understand. Waivers sees a breast lump, sometimes puts his hand on, and then, I mean, the, the things sometimes it's a trouble a little bit when you see a proper doctor. This is the issue. So uh, I am also trying to work in the different stakeholders in the country so that we can make at least uh, NCCN stratified, I mean, resource stratified guidelines to, uh, to make them more harmonized, to use it among the professionals in the country. And uh, one of the oncological society in Nepal, which is called as a Federation of Oncologists of Nepal, which essentially consists of doctors, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists in a single forum. And we are trying to make some, at least a minimum standard guidelines so that we can all follow through. And this is being done. And then uh, I, I'm hopeful that with your inspiration, we should be able to uh, implement these further. And we also seek further assistance from your CCAN group so that we can work together and uh, make it better in the future. Thank you. Yes, Rolando uh, will help you with that. Um, Dr. Wa, Wa Minzu, you know, since the uh, military takeover in Yangon, um, how is your CCAN project progressing? in that sort of situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, meanwhile, the, as the, there is a, that way of COVID is very severe. The, there is a stay home uh, announcement in our Yangon. Mm -hmm. So that the healthcare uh, provision is, uh, is delayed and uh, all the projects are, uh, are delayed too. Okay, so everything is mm -hmm. well, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Lisa, you know, uh, now with COVID, we cannot have face-to-face -face multidisciplinary meetings. Um, how do you cope in Brisbane? Are you still doing face-to-face? -face? Because certainly in most countries, we can't do face-to-face -face entities anymore. Certainly not in my hospital. <laughs> Yes, so that's obviously we're in a, a similar climate as well. So our, our multidisciplinary teams um, and our clinical care, our education uh, is run virtually. So as I mentioned, we have 27 clinics in Australia um, and then we have our clinics in Singapore, Hong Kong and China. So we live on our computers, uh, whether it's in our cars or in our office, um, and all MDTs, um, our direct supervision of patients having chemotherapy, um, that all is all done virtually, virtually with a very strong uh, technical support of, of our IT team. Okay, thank you very much. I think Rolando says the time for discussion is over, no? So, uh, Dr. Aung and Dr. Rolando, would you like to wrap up? Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Yip for moderating the great session. And also, I would like to thank the speaker, Dr. Ben, Prof. Aisha, Lisa, and <clears throat> Dr. Amy. And also, thanks to the participation from the Advisors for Free from Nepal, Dr. Nimal, and Dr. Wawa. And uh, before we close the session, we would like to have the um, evaluation from the, our attendee. And I would like to invite all the attendees to join our Zoom evaluation for the, this session for a couple of minutes. We will give uh, about 30 seconds to answer the questions and we will move on to the next one. Thank you. The first question is, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Now I have a clear understanding on why we should develop the resource group guideline for the management of patients with invasive breast cancer.
Thank you. And next question. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? The discussion was useful opportunity to learn from the nation and locate parts in the area of developing resource appropriate breast cancer management guidelines. Please provide a single choice. Strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree or strongly agree. Uh, Please scroll down the question if you didn't see the question number two. And after the question number two, if you scroll down, there will be the question number three. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? I learn useful information that I can apply to my own practice. Provide the single choice, please. And the last question is overall, how would you rate this discussion? And Thank you so much for providing the evaluation answer. We will end the poll now. Thank you. Now we are coming to an end of our discussion series. So, so today's discussion is about to end and I would like to thanks again to our speaker, Dr. Banderson from the BHC and WHO Global Breast Cancer Initiative, Ms. Lisa Brown from ICON, Prof. Aisha from the University of Malaya Medical Center and Dr. Imi from National Cancer Center Japan, as well as to our co-hosts, the Ancon, Asian National Cancer Center Alliance, National Cancer Center Japan, and Tata Memorial Hospital. We will be following up with you in the next couple of weeks to provide a good summary of this discussion. As to answer from the discussion from the Q&A sessions, and we will be able to provide the uh, and BHCN guide on how to develop the breast cancer guideline. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me and feel free to share it with your colleagues once we share it. I hope that that will be very useful discussion. And I will also would like to invite to the next session on the 24th of September, where we will be focused on the development of the resource appropriate guideline for the management of patients with this time for invasive cervical cancer. And please make sure you register. And if you are interested, and please also share the event link with your colleagues and peer. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach me at my email address. And once again, I would like to thanks to our Siri co-hosts and partners, the Chugai Pharmaceutical and Icon Group for making this Siri discussions happen. And I wish you have a lovely week and looking forward to seeing you again in next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ang. Goodbye, everybody. I hope we meet again next time. <laughs>